So today's, today's event, event picks up on um, a running team, a very long running team um, in the UN. The future we want. But who are we? <laughs> and do you share the same culture, race and religion as me? And do we even have the, share the same vision? Do we want to have the sh same shared vision? And we keep talking about the UN United Nations, but beyond the corridors of power in New York, there are billions of people, each one with their own individual dreams and vision. So the question is not only about how to give them uh, a voice, but also how to give them the tools in order to, for them to realize their own dreams. Today, 10% of the world's population still lives in absolute poverty. That's over 700 million people, or the equivalent of two United States of America. So, Ms. Clark, how far are we from achieving the Sustainable Development Goals? And what could the UNDP under your leadership could have done better in that capacity? Well, firstly, we're quite a long way away. Yeah. Uh, and they are goals set for 2030, but you'll find 2030 comes on us pretty fast. <laughs> I, I often used to reflect that in 2000, as a young prime minister from New Zealand, I went to the Millennium Summit because Kofi Annan put the word out, everyone must come to the summit. And uh, I remember going to sign the Millennium Declaration because the New Zealand Foreign Ministry said, it's all negotiated, you've got to sign the declaration. Good. Well, out of the declaration came this, the uh, Millennium Development Goals, which a lot of people said were never negotiated, but actually pretty much the goals were in the Millennium Declaration. And uh, they got off to a reasonably slow start because they hadn't been, uh, if you like, put to the member states as goals which were going to have an agenda around them. And then around 2005, they held another summit and people thought, oh gosh, there are goals, there are targets, uh, you know, better do something. And by the time I got to UNDP in 2010, it, it was getting some traction, but desperately needed acceleration. And we spent <laughs> a lot of the next five years looking at what will it take and what would be accelerators of MDG uh, uh, progress and so on. Now, I think this, um, this new agenda has a, a different gestation. Uh, the new agenda was very heavily consulted on as an agenda. And it started with a blank piece of paper coming out of the Rio uh, Plus 20, 20 plus. Summit, which said that there should be an open-ended working group convened by the General Assembly, uh, which would negotiate these goals. Now, to inform that process, uh, the Secretary General had a high-level panel, other people did things. What the UN Development System, led by UNDP, did was work with countries on national consultations around the goals. And uh, you know, 88, 90 countries had these national consultations, and they were very inclusive from people from all walks of life. Also, interestingly, uh, there was associated with this huge outreach effort through the UN Development System, uh, a, a global online survey, the My World Survey. Yep. <coughs> and it, uh, it gave about 16 different things people could choose from and said, uh, you know, what would be your top priorities in, in order for the new agenda? Now, what a surprise. The top three priorities in every region of the world were jobs, health and education. And basics, right? Basics of life. And uh, usually, honest and responsive governance came in fourth which also says that the world's people uh, <laughs> think that's rather important and, and a lot uh, don't, don't experience it. Uh, perhaps a bit disappointing that environment came down lower, but then we have to think about these th things holistically. And what I know for a fact is that you will not solve the huge pressures on our environment, uh, our wildlife, our habitat, our biodiversity and so on, unless you get on top of poverty eradication, because there's always going to be uh, issues uh, if, if people are poor and, and have to live. Um, as well, of course, this agenda applies to industrialised countries as well as to developing. And I think that with the MDGs, the developed countries like my own, the Netherlands, etc., we were pretty much left off the hook. We were supposed to pay up, and some of us did and some of us didn't, but we didn't have goals and targets that we had to meet in other areas. Now we do. And you can go through the 2030 agenda and say there's something for absolutely every country on earth to do here, and for some, quite a lot. Leave no one behind, 
This becomes particularly relevant in an increasingly diverse Europe uh, with many uh, newcomers, new residents, new citizens. Are they going to enjoy the same you know, rights and opportunities as others? Uh, th these are big issues. So look, it, it is a very ambitious agenda. It's very, very wide. It, it, it's, it's quite complicated. Um, but you know, it, it is the only game in town in terms of a universally agreed vision for what the world could be, and we have to give it our best shot. I, I think it is unquestionable um, to say that the SDGs are major improvement compared mm. to the MDGs. Uh, there is this funny criticism that the MDGs were drafted by mm. a bunch of men, technocrats at the UN in the basement. <laughs> And but what do you make of the current criticisms um, of the SDGs? That there are mm. too many of them, that they are too complicated, and that they address the symptoms rather than the causes of, of poverty. So if you if you really wanted a measurable development agenda, you wouldn't have 17 goals and 169 targets and more than 200 indicators, right? Look, I've led a government. You can't have 17 goals. <laughs> you can't have 169 targets. Um, so that, that's, a, that's a problem, and the MDGs, of course, were concise, few in number, and measurable. There are eight goals, seven of the substantive development goals, one around partnerships, and there are about 29 targets. So that, that was more manageable. On the other hand, if you're going to have a big vision for sustainable development, then it is, it is quite, quite large. Even so, I think it could have been organized so that the territory was covered without it being sort of so many little 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 bits and pieces. So one of the tasks um, UNDP took on, in its own right and in leading the development system, was to reach out to countries, obviously to, to offer support on how to prepare to tackle the agenda. Uh, and we called it mainstreaming it into the national development processes because these agendas will never get anywhere unless countries own them. If countries say, oh, well, that was agreed at the UN, but you know we're getting on with life, <laughs> nothing will ever happen. So uh, we spent a lot of time in the run-up to the uh, promulgation of the, of the SDGs, because everyone knew what was coming you know, months before. And since, with, um, with missions into countries and other agencies came on these, uh, where you would sit down with the country's key uh, strategic figures in, in the government and say, okay, Let's let's do uh, the exercise here, and th they wanted to do this. Say, what does your national plan cover, and what's in the SDGs that you haven't gone anywhere near? And you can't identify where there would need to be, you know, some fill-in or some more ambition, and then, and and that's even before you start to think. Well, if I want to get there, what do I have to do? You know, where am I going to try and pull on expertise and ideas and and so on? How am I going to budget for this? Uh, what about the reporting mechanisms? Of course, uh, UN agencies we will always push uh, citizen participation and inclusion. That's extremely important. It can't just be a government exercise. At the national level, it has to involve the municipalities and provinces and states where, where they are there, but it must involve uh, citizens. Also, uh, the private sector, because if the private sector carries on doing business as usual the old mm. way, you'll never achieve the SDGs yep. either. They have to act differently. And also the way in which government designs policy and regulates will be conducive or not conducive to sustainable development. So, you know, th it, it is complicated, but our work was to try and... Um, you know, make, make it manageable. And if countries could focus on, well, wh where are our big gaps, right? Um, look, yes, we've got a national education strategy, but is it going to get us to where we need to be? And what would we need to invest to do that? And then maybe what, if it's the least developed country without you know, too many resources, what could we put pitch to partners which would help us fill that, that, that gap? Uh, what areas have we not even thought of? You know, so that's the kind of sort of practical support that yep. the UN could give. Follow on, uh, yeah. Following up on, on that exactly, um, I was in the fifth Congress of the African uh, Union in Malabo not long ago, mm. and one common complaint is that 17 goals are too many. We cannot mm. implement and report mm. on each mm. one of them. So mm. what should be the best practice for such countries? <laughs> and should they try to uh, make progress incrementally on each across the board, or should they rely on their strength for specific and key areas? Well, <laughs> yeah, look, the SDG purists will say that it's a universal um, 
uh, interrelated, interlinked to gender, and yeah. you have to do everything, but you can't do everything. On the other hand, there are very important areas which would be very easy for some governments to drop. You know, now that's why a goal like the one around gender equality and, and women's empowerment uh, shouldn't just be seen as standalone goal, uh, yep. but it, it is also mainstreamed across everything yep. else. So, really, what that is signalling is yes, there are a there is a goal, and there's a whole lot of targets around gender equality and women's empowerment. But actually, as you plan your education, economic, health, everything strategy, you've got to be factoring the women into this. Yep. You know, that's yep. got you've just got to mainstream gender equality. And if you then looking at where are we going to get the most the most gains. You know, what are the things you could touch which would have the biggest impact? Gender equality is so obvious. I mean, why wouldn't a country want gender equality? If you don't have gender equality in your wages, your economy, and so on, you're never going to fulfil the goals that you have for your economy, for growth, for income, uh, for the rest of it. If the rights arguments don't work, you go to the money. And countries are missing out because their women are missing out. Now, uh, about 18 months, 20 months ago, I was in Kenya for the big Japan uh, Africa uh, Development Conference, which is held from time to time. And UNDP took the opportunity to release, with so many African uh, yep. heads of state there, uh, the latest Africa Human Development Report. And it was on the impact of gender inequality uh, in the workplace. And it actually, the model it it developed, it, it came up with an estimate that Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, lost $95 billion every year because of gender inequality. So I, the president of Kenya came, and he's actually very good on these issues, but people need ammunition. So I opened the book as we were sitting at lunch. I had a big graph there, and it had <laughs> $95 billion is what Africa is missing out on. I said, look at this. He said, it's a no-brainer. It's a no-brainer. We are crazy if we don't see gender equality as a key thing in advancing us. So you look at things like that. You also look at energy. Sustainable and modern energy is a catalyst for yep. so many things. And I could you know, rage on for hours about some of the practical examples. Mm -hmm. But you know, when you take basic power to a village, what happens? The woman can do processed products they never could before. Yeah. You know, I remember going for the first time to see one of these standalone power plants in uh, Burkina Faso, and they turned on an engine, which of course should be biofuel, not all of them are yet, but you know, people were very glad to have the engine. And they put uh, rice, which was still in its husk, through this engine, and the husk flew out one way and the rice the other. I said, great, show me what you used to do. So then they brought out the big pot and the mallet, and they demonstrated what they used to do. I mean, it's a no-brainer, the time that that engine mm -hmm. saved. And then the woman had the time to do other things, like uh, the power could help them process you know, chutneys for the mango, or what, whatever it was. Um, the children could read to do their homework at night under a light that was powered by the engine in the village, and that can come through, through solar. Uh, it was helpful in so many ways. I went back to Burkina Faso about uh, probably 18 months ago, and I went to another of these standalone engines. And what had changed in the years since I'd first seen it was alongside the engine was a great board with all the plug-in points for charging the cell phones. And I thought, when you first designed the engine for the village, you'd never have thought of mm. that that was going to be a key use. But people are so connected now. So again, gender equality, yep. uh, energy, ICT is a huge catalyst for development. It, you know, investing in your connectivity. Uh, so that farmers get the proper weather information. They know what the price is, when you send stuff to market. You know. So look for all the things that are going to be catalytic across a whole lot of goals and go after those. Yeah. You spoke about the, uh, the private sector and mm. the ICTs as well. Mm. Mm. Y y for the SDGs, you have various stakeholders. You have mm. national governments, NGOs, the private mm. sector, but also civil mm. society. How do you make sure that there is an accountability and could frontier technologies like blockchain help create positive fit, uh, feedback loops, for example, in order to create more accountability? Well, I mean, blockchain is in some ways overrated, but uh, <laughs> also has, <laughs> has potential, right? Yeah. Um, but the, the key thing is accountability, that uh, you know, the public has a right to know what its money is being spent on, uh, and it's got a right to know what it's getting for that, that money uh, being, being spent. 
And let, let's face it, there is a significant problem of lack of accountability for public finances in quite a number of countries. You know, I can put my hand up and say I'm proud that my little country, I think, is again rated the most transparent uh, and, and honest in the world. We fight with Denmark and Finland and uh, you know, maybe the Netherlands <laughs> for, uh, for that. And we have very high degree of transparency. Mm. But again, if we're going to see that every available dollar for development goes to development, you know, getting cleaning this sort of stuff up is extremely important. You know, the, you know, I've travelled to, to so many countries where you go, you know, to the end of the road, the end of the track, and beyond, and people, for them, life hasn't changed a lot in hundreds of years, probably, mm -hmm. and down in the capital, people are living like kings. It's not right. And I think if there were more accountability, um, probably more literacy, more of access to information, you know, that that would help it not not be that way. And just a system that is working mm. more efficiently mm. and stuff. Yeah. Let's talk about climate change. Yeah, I think we all agree that the 2015 Paris Climate Agreement was groundbreaking in so many ways until the U.S. unilateral withdrawal. But there are positive signs, including uh, the emergence of the U.S. Climate Alliance, which is a coalition of 17 states, mm -hmm. including mm -hmm. Washington, Virginia, uh, New York. And there is also the United Nations uh, non-state um, actor zone for climate action, which mm -hmm. encompasses 2,500 cities and mm -hmm. 200 regions worldwide. Mm -hmm. So I in a world that is increasingly defined in environmental terms. Do you think that tomorrow the future is around cities and regions as centre of power? Well, I think cities and regions can do a tremendous amount. Uh, but you do need governments at the national yeah. and federal government acting as well. Uh, I mean, if, of course, it's very unfortunate that the US has marched out for the time being. I mean, they will be back one day, different president, whatever. Uh, but um, you know, they are limited to two terms, <laughs> at the most. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, I mean, thank goodness for the very resolute stand of yep. a lot of the major states, states. And, and cities. I mean, a state like California, we used to say that California on its own was in the top ten biggest economies in the world. So if California acts, that's got mm. scale, uh, which is uh, so, so important. But, look, the Paris Acli Climate Agreement is an ambitious agreement. But the member states are not ambitious enough. Not a single one of our countries is ambitious enough. Uh, I'm now seeing uh, forecasts that the temperature rise over pre-industrial levels will exceed 1.5 degrees, the goal of the Paris Agreement, yep. by the 2040s. Right? So then there's a, a draft report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which will come out at some point this year, they are forecasting on current trends and commitments that there is only a 5% chance, a 1 in 20 chance, that we will not exceed 2 degrees by the end of the century. Now, this is catastrophic. We look at what is already happening to our weather. I mean, you know, I've been very exposed, obviously, to the problems of small island states, the horrific problems for the farmer in Africa who never knows when the rain's coming and you've only got credit for one set of planting and the rain doesn't come, you're in, you're in deep trouble. I look at my own country, I, we have wild weather now, what, unpredictable weather that we, we're not really used to, you know, sort of that four major cyclonic type storms coming through in the summer, uh, more drought than we used to have, and we're trying to make a living, you know, off 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 the land. So, it, it's a huge issue, and I just say that every country needs citizen pressure on it to do more, yep. much much more. Accountability again. Yeah. Uh, according to um, the UNHCR, um, the number of forcibly displaced people at the end of 2014 was mm. around 59.5 million, which is mm. technically the size of the UK, mm. and it's the highest since the end of the war. Uh, mm. And some of those people are being displaced because of climate mm. change and mm. global warming. Um, what, do you, what is your answer to people who say that there should have been a global goal for migrants and refugees, and that this should have been a standalone priority for the UN? Well, the forcibly displaced numbers, I think, by the end of 2016 had gone to 
65.6 million. If you look at the total number of migrants in the world today, it's about a quarter of a billion. And in that first figure, the 65.6 million, that doesn't include uh, the migration up out of a lot of sub-Saharan yep. Africa where there's not war, but there's lack of opportunity. Yep. So people are looking for where is the opportunity, and there's seen to be opportunity in Europe, as there's seen to be opportunity yep. in North America or, or wherever. So it is indeed you know, the decade yep. of the migrant, but the, the global agenda doesn't particularly speak to that. Migration has been very sensitive among member states, very, very sensitive. In fact, in my earlier years at UNDP, it was quite hard uh, for the agencies, and you know that was across all of us, the Human Rights uh, uh, Office of the High Commissioner, UNHCR, um, UNDP, UNICEF, it was hard for us to get perspectives into the member state meetings on them. They didn't really want to hear from us because we have uncomfortable truths to tell about how people are treated. Um, I think the US has just withdrawn from negotiations for the Global Compact uh, on Migration, which is that people are trying to put together at, at the moment. So it's highly controversial. Uh, but uh, among the most marginalised and discrimina discriminated against people in many societies are, of course, migrants. Um, and the, the forcible displacement, um, which is the largest ever measured, actually larger than post-World War II uh, now, um, is largely, of course, driven by, by conflict. Uh, but if um, climate change bites, uh, you'll get a lot of forcible displacement uh, within countries, let alone between. You know, think of people who live on the great deltas of, of Bangladesh. <laughs> if they're underwater, you can't stay there. They're going to have to go somewhere. And if they go inland to inadequate city infrastructure or other parts of countryside where they don't have land rights, you know, th th there's a lot of conflict and misery implicit in all this. Yeah. Mm. So some people say that um, the UN usually revolves around the Security Council and the power mm -hmm. play, and then there is too much narrow casting to policy makers mm -hmm. and not enough broadcasting to citizens. Mm -hmm. And speaking to reaching the right audience here at mm -hmm. uh, the United Nations University, we do a lot of research trying to um, have socially um, effective goals, socially relevant mm -hmm. goals. Mm -hmm. And you've been a policy maker mm -hmm. for a long period of time. What is the best way to present academic research in order to, uh, for it to have any relevance to changing and affecting policy? Well, I think for the UN University, which actually I've, I've never had a close relationship yeah. with. I mean, it's always been there um, and it, you know, it, it works away. But my view would be that it could make itself highly relevant uh, to... Uh, policy makers in the agencies with yeah. SDG relevant research and also on research that is relevant to uh, conflict prevention mm. and peace building. Um, because all of us, you know, we're all to some degree or another in the agencies, we're active in the space. You know, what, what will help drive peaceful, harmonious societies based on the rule of law that don't break down into conflict and yeah. what are, you know, what, where's the evidence uh, on what works for that? Where's the evidence on, you know, what what kind of path to to try to follow to lift from uh, where you are to where you want to be? You know, so ev evidence-based um, policy it? making it it needs research, it needs yep. information, and I think. Uh, Probably you and you, I mean, clearly it's got a wide range of students uh, yeah. studying very interesting things apart from what its own staff are doing. Uh, I think raising awareness of, of, of what, what is coming out of the walls of, of the university uh, would be very helpful so that you know, the agencies are aware of your product, if you like, because we tend not to be uh, so aware if I put my past hat on. Yeah. Mm. Uh, you've visited many, many, many times and many places in Africa, uh, mm. Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea, where I come from, mm. were the hardest hit nations by the recent Ebola crisis. Mm. It took five months and over 1,000 deaths before the UN declared uh, the outbreak as an international health emergency. Mm. So you mm. were also um, the mm. chairwoman of mm. the United Nations Development Group, which mm. encompasses the World Health Organization. C mm. Could you give us an internal perspective of how 
all the UN agencies manage the crisis at the time? Well, it was actually more than five months, wasn't it? Because the first case actually occurred in Guinea yep. in, I think, December. Of 2013. Correct. And then in March, it, it started to come to attention. Yeah. Right. Uh, now, WHO uh, should have had an effective early warning system because when you hear Ebola, <laughs> you, you've got to jump on that fast. The world has experience of Ebola, albeit a different strand of it, but raising similar issues uh, in Democratic Republic of Congo and Uganda. And occasionally they do still get a case or two, but they jump on it fast. Yeah. You know, they, they <laughs> do know that you have to deal with it fast. But for whatever reason, this did not trigger uh, what it should have triggered in, in WHO. Now, uh, okay, let, let's then look at WHO's problems. WHO uh, was seriously underfunded, in my view. It had had significant funding cuts. Yep. It had made, accordingly, a lot of cuts in its spending. And this area, I understand, was one that was adversely affected. Second structural problem WHO has, which no one seems to be able to fix, is that the Director General of WHO does not appoint her his uh, regional uh, Director yep. Generals. They are elected by member states. So you can get quite political elections, and then that politicisation has often gone down the line, influencing who is appointed as a country director for the WHO, and that person... Uh, then forms a close political relationship with the Ministry of Health. None of this is conducive, really, to speaking truth to power about what has to be done. Uh, so uh, my recollection is that uh, the regional office of WHO in Brazzaville was left by Geneva to deal with this. Dr Chan began to sense that this was not adequate. She went to the countries. Um, but then you also have the siloed attitude of health. You know, often you look at WHO documents, you'd think the rest of the world didn't exist outside the health sector. And, you know, you, you can't act like that. WHO needed to call for help a lot earlier. And in the end, it was Jan Eliasson as DSG and myself and some others at a meeting said, look, you know, Margaret needs help. Now, it wasn't so easy to help them. Uh, and the epidemic had gone along yep. uh, quite a long way. Uh, but eventually, yes, the emergency was called and a mission was set up. I mean, whether that was a wise use of resource is another matter anyway. I mean, but uh, a lot of money was spent on trying to stamp out a disease um, uh, which should never have got as much traction as it did. Also, the early responses were inappropriate. So if we take your own yep. dear country, um, <laughs> I, I am familiar with... Uh, you know, attitudes towards burial and grieving, which are not what we have in a European country. In my country, indigenous people take a corpse. The corpse lies uh, in a meeting house for a number of days. People come, they touch the corpse, they kiss it. There's a lot of ritual around the death. Now, I think in your country, a traditional task of the woman is to dress the body of the dead. And so when... Uh, People came in from what looked like Mars in these spacesuits, all protected, and said, you can't do that with this body, and took the body away. People said, what's going on here? You know, there's absolutely no cultural sensitivity. And you had cases where the body was dug up after the men in Mars suits went away. And then, of course, people are touching it, and the, the body where the person's died of a bowl. Of, I mean, there were just basic things that were never done, and we never got on top of that epidemic until it, it went back to the community level of sensitisation of people understanding what it was. It took a lot of talking. Uh, so there are so many public health lessons you can draw from this. It's also the case that the, all three countries were, if you like, countries in recovery from trauma. Your country from decades of dictatorship. Sierra Leone from a civil war. Liberia from a civil war. These were countries where... Transition. They were in transition, but there was very little trust in authorities. So the authorities telling you to do something didn't necessarily get taken that seriously either because they'd never done any good for you. Mm. So, you know, so it highlighted so many issues that related to least developed country status, yep. fragile countries, recovering from 
past trauma, very, very complicated, but we have to learn from it. Uh, let me ask a uh, last question before moving to questions from the audience. Um, there is this argument that many UN development agencies mostly are mm. tribal, that they work in silos and mm. that they are not um, complementary to each other as much. Um, d do you find any validity in that, or do you think it's a little bit an unfair and over-the-top criticism? Well, f uh, no, funnily enough, they are more or less complementary because they have their sectoral mandates. So yep. UNICEF works for children, UN Women works for women, health works for health, <laughs> you know, labour works for labour, and on we go on. But that's the problem, isn't it? Because they're not used to kind of uh, seeing their mandate in the broader context. You can't achieve anything for children if a country's at war or people are so poor they can't properly nourish their children and, 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 and so on. Uh, so, yes, they, they need, th they do come together around the UN Development Assistance Framework, which is negotiated between the UN country team of agencies and the, yep. and the partner uh, government. But it, it has always been a challenge to get uh, sort of, you know, cross programming across agencies and so on. I mean, th this will be, you know, a life's journey to get agencies to uh, to work together. And it, it applies also to the NGOs that operate, to the bilateral partners. I mean, often people like to put their own flag over everything and not see that, you know, they're part of something that has to be dealt with more holistically. Yeah. Thank you so much. Mm. Um, we'll take some questions from the audience. Uh, raise your hand. The microphone would come to you. If you can introduce yourself briefly, you can have one or two questions. Yep. Microphone. Thank you very much for being here tonight. Um, uh, we really appreciate the opportunity. And actually, I wanted to ask a question more to the second to last topic that we spoke about regarding health. Um, is it working? Can everyone hear me? Okay. I think you'll have to speak loudly. Louder, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, is this better? <laughs> no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really screaming. Is into that microphone, microphone working? Or okay. Um, so my question is actually because also regarding to UNICEF protection, we prov they provide a lot of vaccinations, but there's a big issue also with pharmaceutical companies who are publicly funded for the most part. Um, so the member states would have a opportunity to pressure pharmaceutical companies into providing more uh, research assistance, for example, into medication. Ah, there we go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> into uh, medication or access to medi uh, medicines in developing countries or neglected tropical diseases, which aren't an issue in countries such as uh, the Netherlands, for example, now, but do obviously have a big impact on the lack of development or stagnate development in certain countries that would otherwise be able to have access to the medications if uh, member states and especially also the World Health Organization would maybe put a little bit more pressure. Is there maybe uh, an opinion that you have on this topic uh, of why this isn't happening? Um, I mean, it, it's, it's not my area of expertise, but I think uh, what has been uh, very, very helpful uh, in general is uh, you know, drugs coming off patent and having generic uh, manufacturing at scale. Um, that, that helps reduce uh, cost uh, a lot. Um, I think, um, <sighs> you know, it, it's been quite hard for a lot of developed countries to put in place uh, firm, you know, access to medicine at a reasonable price uh, policy frameworks. My own uh, country, and this goes back to a sort of earlier phase of the government I was in, uh, set up you know, quite an aggressive uh, purchasing arm of the state for pharmaceutical purchasing and uh, was um, very rigorous about what it paid for what and picked up generics as fast as it could. But, you know, often smaller countries can be very much bullied by um, big pharma into, you know, not, not doing these things and paying more than they should. So there is a whole access to medicines report uh, that was... Um, uh, done by a commission uh, appointed by UNDP, uh, the UN AIDS organisation and the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights that went into a lot of these issues, which it would be uh, worth looking at. Uh, but suffice to say, you know, access to quality and affordable medicines remains a significant challenge. And I understand that 
you know, one of the fastest growing areas of illicit trade is the trade in fake pharmaceuticals. Yeah. And uh, quite a lot of children in particular die because of fake pharmaceuticals uh, in countries where you know, pharmaceuticals aren't properly subsidised at all. And so people see the sort of cheap shop in the market that's offering you the cure and you buy that and you buy a fake drug. And a lot of these fakes are so good that they, you know, you, the lay person cannot tell the difference between the packaging. Um, but the drug will do absolutely nothing for you and might actually kill you. Um, so, yeah, I think there's just a ton of issues around <laughs> pharmaceuticals that need to be tackled. And, and one of the you know, capacity-building tasks uh, that should be supported in development is uh, support for uh, effective purchasing and regulation of pharmaceutical use. Mm. Maybe... The gentleman here. Yeah. Um, so I would like to, <coughs> uh, first of all, thanks a lot for uh, this uh, uh, in-depth uh, lecture. I would like to ask a question, which um, I've been like also discussing a bit with uh, uh, my friends, but in general, like something that I um, deeply care about. Maybe like, I mean, I'm studying economics now, and um, I'm. European Studies second year student. And the thing is that really kind of uh, disturbs me a bit is that in economics you always talk about growth and production. Uh, and you never talk about sustainability. And I think that that's really a problem with uh, the like education system, but also like, because if we always learn about uh, growth instead of sustainability, we'll end up doing repeating the same mistakes that has been done so mm. do you think that ultimately like at the end um like how do you think that sustainability and growth are interrelated to each other and do you think that ultimately like at the end is growth will lead to inequality because that's uh how we've been seeing uh since ni the 1990s i mean equality is rising so mm. that's my question well, firstly, I think you know th you have to consciously be pushing for countries to decarbonise their their growth, to to de-link, you know, growing far carbon footprint, <laughs> and and you know, see see growth as something that can be uh, environmentally uh, sustainable. Uh, I mean, secondly, growth, in, in my opinion, is rather important for countries which have very low levels of income per capita. Money isn't everything. <laughs> but there's a point at which you have far too little, right? Where you can't supply the, the basics uh, uh, for your family and where a state can't supply the, the basics of what citizens would like to have as, as, as services uh, from the state. Everything from infrastructure to health and education and social transfers and benefits and, and all of these things. And thirdly, on inequality, well, uh, you know, that, that again, I think, is an issue for public policy. Uh, how do you, you know, how do you carve up the cake? Uh, you know, how is the social wage constructed? Because, uh, you know, people's incomes is one thing, but what goes alongside that is whether or not education is uh, free and accessible, is health free and accessible. You know, are, are, there, are there social benefits? So, uh, governments through their public policy settings can do an enormous amount to to even things up uh, without you know, having to go anywhere near the idea that everyone will be paid the same, because they, they won't be. But, but you can even up the odds uh, through the policy settings that you have. By the way, I'm also an economist and I work on growth, so I can guarantee you that growth is, you, there is this such a thing as called um, green growth, so sometimes mm -hmm. sustainability is yeah. also um, an indicator or a variable that is mm -hmm. taken into account. Any other question? The lady over there? Yeah. Thank you for your discussion. I am uh, a PhD student at uh, UNU Merit. And um, going back to your uh, earlier, discuss oh, sorry, earlier discussion on climate change, you said that one important step forward would be to empower citizens to hold the government uh, accountable in tackling climate change. However, uh, some moments before that, you mentioned the results of a survey where uh, people from 80 plus countries mm. put uh, um, mm. environmental sustainability quite uh, lower in their priority list. Mm. 
So my questions would be, in your experience, what are the success, what have been the success stories in uh, dealing with um, uh, citizen empowerment in um, environmental sustainabilities? What approaches have not worked if more like top-down approaches have failed more than uh, bottom-up ones? Mm. Um, what uh, would the New Zealand have to teach other countries in terms of um, empowering the governments to have a strong hold on uh, particularly the energy transitions? Mm. And um, there will be, if I'm correct, there will be a new expertise center of the UN on climate change set in the Netherlands. Uh, like there is, uh, yeah, in their early stages of discussion now or of planning. And if this particular center would have a role in uh, citizen empowerment in tackling climate change. Thank you. Well, my, my view is that it needs leadership and it needs engaged citizens, right? <laughs> I mean, you know, I've, I've been a leader and we prioritise tackling uh, climate change, but I must say you didn't always feel there was a large crowd following you. And I remember you know, see the odd survey in New Zealand which would say, should the government be doing anything about climate change? And, you know, 90% would say, yes, the government should be doing something. And then you go through the questionnaire and it would say, are you prepared to pay more for petrol for your car? No, no. You know. <laughs> so you know, people have got to get real. It's not just the government. Citizens have got to be prepared to take responsibility. And I, you know, I'd rather take my hat off to you know, countries like, like Denmark, which you know, makes such a feature of renewable energy. Uh, you know, your own country, of course, known for its cycling. You know. I mean, we, we've, we've got to really get leadership at, at all levels of, of government, what the municipalities do, how they design, what they say about transport, the energy efficiency, the national standards set by government, all this is important, but the citizens got to push for it as well. Uh, because, you know, I mean, I'm not someone who gets easily discouraged, but it would have been nice to have more supportive noise and not just all the noise from those who didn't want to do anything. Like farmers, they didn't want to change the way they farm. Like car companies who want to sell more cars, most of which are still you know, based around the fossil fuel. Um, you know, there's a lot of you know, sectors that are not helpful on climate change. So you know, particularly young people, I think, who you know, the, f the future is yours, <laughs> need to be very articulate uh, and networking and advocating and using all media at your disposal to say, we want our society to be a standout on this. And I think on top of New Zealand, uh, Costa Rica is a very good example of a country that is succeeding in that energy transition where now more than 87% of the electricity is generated by solar power. And well, Costa Rica has done well in many ways. I mean, it, it, it hasn't had an army for a very long time, mm -hmm. so it doesn't spend any money on that. <laughs> uh, it it uh, actually reforested a lot of its land. Yep. It lost a lot of forest cover, but it made a decision to uh, to replant, and it, it has done incredibly uh, well on that. Um, I mean, New Zealand has been a lucky country in the sense that it had a lot of hydropower mm -hmm. potential. And New Zealand can be 100% renewable. We had a goal for that when I was Prime Minister. Uh, you know, 100% renewable, I mean, when we were thinking about that a decade, 15 years ago, you know, the, I mean, yes, we have a coal-fired plant, but it could have become completely residual. And one would hope with uh, ongoing innovation and technology that you can get away from coal as a residual and go to, you know, stored power from hydro, from, from battery and sun and yep. wind and the rest of it. So, you know, there are technological solutions that are very helpful. There's also energy efficiency solutions, which have been far from fully exploited in, in all countries. Yeah. Uh, so, the gentleman here, maybe. Uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. I have just one qu uh, short question. As we know, poverty is sexist, and uh, most of the people who are actually uh, poor are women who are contributing largely uh, to their economy, helping family, their communities, and so on. 
However, uh, many cultures in the developing countries uh, uh, are m masculine, so to say. Uh, they prefer actually, uh, and they put men in power. So how do you uh, think UN uh, could change the narrative and actually uh, define culture m as more equal? Mm. Because this goes hand in hand with poverty. Well, <laughs> I think the, the UN has done quite a good job on setting the you know the values framework for this so you know if you go back to the universal declaration of human rights which has its big <laughs> anniversary this year 70th anniversary uh, it it defined gender equality as as a, a basic human right all those years ago and then over the years you had the commission on the status of women development and the uh, convention on the elimination of discrimination against uh, women eventually the formation of UN women there's been a you know a lot of uh, positive things like that but again you know th that the values framework is there but uh, are countries following it you know you can look at the you know sort of proportion of women in leadership positions around the world today just over 7% of heads of state and that includes queens, right? <laughs> mm. Dutch have had queens. Uh, New Zealand has a queen based in London. So uh, of heads of government, uh, just over 1 in 20, five, just over 5% are female. Uh, the proportion of women in the world's parliaments, 23%. Uh, on uh, company boards, pathetic. So, yeah, I mean, societies, I think, have to take it in their own hands to say it's, it's got to be different. We've got to see women more equally represented in these key decision-making uh, structures. And uh, I think the UN's put the framework there, but uh, it takes two to tango. But let, let me play the devil's advocate there. Mm. Um, does having women in power empower women per se? Because we have Margaret Thatcher in mind, we have Indira Gandhi, whose priority was population control and next door we have Angela Merkel where mm. you could argue that her record on gender equality haven't been what you might have expected so mm. well I, I don't think you can put it all on on one woman's shoulders can you yeah. I mean you need uh, more women in the parliament yeah. uh, and in the senior levels of public administration which is advising on on policy uh, definitely need many more women in the in the private sector uh, senior structures, um, but I think you also have, you know, among the women who've come to power in the last you know, 20, 25 years or so, uh, you know, women who have, by and large, been prepared to do something uh, to to elevate the position of women. And uh, I mean, New Zealand now has its third woman prime minister, who's 37 years of age. Um, Iceland's had three women leaders, uh, one president, two, two prime ministers. I personally think uh, Angela Merkel is an outstanding example of global leadership. The world would be worse for not having had her. Um, and she has uh, uh, always presented herself as a very straightforward person. You know, her, her words, her bond, she you know, showed high levels of integrity in public office. That is a very, very good role model. And there won't be any young German girl growing up today who doesn't say, wow, you know, maybe that could be me or my friend or my sister. You know, it's, it's an incredible example. Uh, so I think yeah, the, of, of the post-war baby boomer generation of women politicians, a lot of them are role modeling as, you know, examples of what can be achieved through uh, having women in high places. Um, I was told by Ms. Clark that there is some room for more questions, but try to be as brief as possible. Yeah. Maybe the lady over there. Kia ora koutou i taku ingoa. Nō rotoru i Aotearoa hau. Nō mai haere mai. Bye, Helen. Hi. Kia ora motu kōrero. I have a question that is a sort of follow-up, I suppose, from the man in front of me and a few other questions that have been flying around. Um, and it's something that you mentioned earlier when you were talking about the development goals and uh, what I wanted to ask was about what corporations can do to implement those, whether there should be stricter ties on 
activity that is in the business sphere to implement those, whether the balance of power between the public and private sector is um, in an okay place, whether international and national governments still have uh, power to uh, control the corporations that act in their nations and whether that is happening in the right way, do you think? A follow-up question to that could be, would that be better put into place if more women were on corporate boards? Thanks. Yes, I mean, uh, on the women on corporate boards issue, I mean, the facts are that uh, companies with significant numbers of women on their boards and in senior management do do better than the others. What a surprise. They're more attuned to, you know, more of the population, aren't they? Um, so, again, if, you, if people aren't impressed by the rights argument, always go to the money. You know, they're going to do better if they've got uh, more, more senior women's representation in, in their structures. But your more broader question was, what can corporations do? What should they be doing? Well, firstly, th there needs to be a lot more awareness of the sustainable development vision and the goals. Uh, of course, there are many leading companies, and a lot in this country, which are very plugged in to you know what's going on at the global level they're plugged into the UN global compact you know they there are many companies which have taken the SDGs and looked at how they reflect them in their corporate and strategic planning you know, that, that isn't that where we'd like them all to get to to say how does this relate to me what could I do I, I must say I found in you know, particularly my later years as New Zealand Prime Minister and we're now going back more than nine years uh, that increasingly when you were asked to open something for a company, they wanted to show you what they were doing for sustainability, whether it was the inks and the printing press or the, the, the energy efficiency or, or whatever it was. There was a lot of interest in that. But we you know, have to make that, you know, really the way of doing business. First, that they want to do it that way, but also then countries, municipalities need to look at their regulatory and structures to see that it, it incentivizes uh, that. Uh, I think uh, with respect to some of the big issues like transport and energy, uh, the way in which uh, government sets the policy framework will encourage where investment uh, goes. Um, you know, into renewable energy, into wind energy, into you know whatever. Uh, the way in which you you run your cities, like the the city of London, who wants to take a car in there these days? It's very expensive, so it incentivises public transport. Uh, th there's many things governments can do to sort of steer where investment uh, goes in a direction of of sustainability. So. Yeah, you know, I, I live in hope that, uh, you know, more and more companies will be smart enough to see that the way of the future is to do business sustainably and to take pride on that and measure themselves against this. This goes far beyond sort of narrow concepts of corporate social responsibility and funding a little project here or there, nice as it may be. Uh, the issue is how are you doing business? What do you stand for? What are your basic values? Are you operating in a sustainable way, you know, uh, and of course, along all that, are you treating your employees fairly, uh, are you providing a good workplace culture and so on. But uh, I, I really do believe that the way business does business will have a, a huge impact on whether this sustainable development vision is achieved. The gentleman with the glasses in the middle. It's you. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Uh, hello, thank you. Uh, this is Sean Ghazi, a research fellow from UNU Merit. My question is sort of a follow-up from the previous one, more on the role of private sector in development. Uh, I know since 10 years ago, UNDP had this in growing inclusive business, inclusive market initiatives, and there are many other similar initiatives around the world to encourage private sector to play a better role, but still we, we don't see it happening in in a in a scale we would mm. like it to be, mm. in your view, what what are the obstacles for having improving the role of private sector in development? What what could be done better? Well, maybe engaging more with the um, uh, the sort of sector organisations, you know, the uh, the national business councils, the 
yeah, the industry sectors themselves, because company by company, it's a hard grind, isn't it? But uh, if it if it becomes, you know, what the companies in the forestry industry are seized with the importance of, or if agriculture gets the message as a sector that you know this is the way we need to go, and that's accompanied by some encouragement from uh, from government and government policy, I think yeah, we, it needs to go to scale. Uh, of course. You know, there, there are many good examples of businesses doing the right thing, and, th and they need profile and, and, and publicity, and they should get a reward for that, of you know, being the sort of you know, companies that people would want to do business with. Uh, you know, the ethical consumer has to become a reality. Uh, I mean, one of the issues I engaged in a lot at UNDP on was uh, uh, trying to get to zero deforestation and supply chains. And one of the major proponents of that was, was Unilever with Paul Polman, right? The Dutch uh, global uh, corporate leader, uh, very, very vested in the success of Paris and, and, and the SDGs. And uh, we, we got, you know, what we estimate was close to 90% of the buying power of palm oil signed up to the zero deforestation goal over a period of time. Now, that, that, that can be huge. Uh, that needs to move on to soy and cattle and uh, you know, some of the other commodities which uh, uh, have driven uh, land clearance. But if you can get a, a whole sector on board, you've got a possibility. And, and that works where you have government regulation, you have the company will uh, to be part of it, and where you also support the, the small holders uh, to be able to operate in a sustainable way that doesn't involve uh, land clearance. But, there, you know, there are some encouraging examples. The lady over here. Uh, thank you. Um, I work for the UN in Bonn and before that um, in the UN Environment Programme in Nairobi. And I have a question for you about the Me Too movement, which has barely touched the UN. Um, the Guardian newspaper has been doing, I think, a fabulous job of trying to bring cases out in public. but you know you know the the culture in the UN where often problems the victim is the person with the problem the victim leaves the victim is fired the victim's contract isn't renewed um, the worst case that often happens to perpetrators is that they might get moved to another job mm -hmm. and because of the multilateral nature of the UN where everybody's from somewhere else do you think it's possible that we can actually sort of get on top of this in the UN? Do you think there's hope, and if so, how do we do it? Mm. Well, f look, w we have to say there's hope, right? <laughs> um, and, uh, I mean, you're mentioning The Guardian, which, of course, is running quite a lot on UN AIDS at the moment, which uh, has had a major ex expose uh, on, on this. Uh, and, you know, I mean, Obviously, I, re I reflect on my own experience there, and I think a number of current heads and former heads would say the same, that when someone made a complaint of the kind of behaviour that characterises what's driven me to, a complaint would always go to the Office of Audit and Investigation. There would be an investigation. And then, uh, depending on the severity of it, it could be anything from a, you know, a a written censure to a demotion uh, to, at the other end of the scale, outright dismissal and referral for prosecution, right? So those were the sanctions. But what you worry about uh, is that uh, there will be women and men too who were uh, subject to such behaviour and who didn't feel they can, could come forward because they felt it might have uh, been harmful to their work. And that, that's what now needs to come out. I'm a great fan of Me Too because I think as long as issues are hidden under the carpet, th they're never going to be dealt with. So these things have to come out. It, it's interesting in New Zealand that the, the main focus of it coming out has been in the law profession. And I think most people are completely disgusted with what they're reading about a lot of behaviour in the New Zealand law profession and even in the student law societies, uh, which sort of you know, groom them uh, before they go into the, uh, the profession. And, and you know, no doubt heads will roll, but there needs to be a systematic change in the culture. And the same will, is, is really true through all sectors of society. And the 
UN is not immune from that and has to face up to it. The lady over here. Sorry. Hello, and thank you very much for this lovely um, discussion presentation. One question, if by um, some technological advancement you could actually have a video conference with um, your younger self, what <laughs> insightful advice would you give about um, your uh, idea about the UN and the future you want? Oh, it's like rewinding the, the, the film reel, isn't <laughs> it? <laughs> um, because, you know, if you, if you go back to your younger self, I mean, a lot of the things I've done would not have been deemed remotely possible. So I think the advice would just be if you see an open door, walk through it, right? Don't say, like many women do, oh, not me, oh, I couldn't do this. You know, of course you can. You know, and that's always my advice to young people, you know, just uh, see an open door, walk through it, you know. If it's not open, kick it down. You know. <laughs> 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 Further questions? Mm. Gentlemen? Thank you very much for the opportunity. My name is Daniel Ungoro from Kenya. I'm a master's student at UNU Merit. So my question is about the representation now that you have you, we've seen a lot about leadership from your end. You've been the UN. So what can you talk about the UN representation, the Security Council for the Africans, given that we're the majority, and it's about representation and leadership? Yeah. Well, some of these questions will probably come out after the film, uh, uh -huh. because a lot of the focus in the film is on uh, uh, the Security Council. And uh, the UN has a problem. It wrote, it, it had a, a charter drafted in 1945, which was before I was born, let alone most people in this room. And the charter, you know, gave a permanent membership of the Security Council and a veto, in effect, to those who won the Second World War. But it's now <laughs> 2018, right? And it did that at a time uh, when Africa was colonised. You know, we didn't see the proud and independent countries that make up Africa today. So no one spoke for them. You know? There was a white minority regime in South Africa, but you know, <laughs> I guess for sub-Saharan Africa, it, it, it didn't have a voice in the drafting. So then you come to the various efforts to reform the UN. Mm. And, uh, well, the UN Security Council reform is stymied by the veto because old saying, no turkey votes for an early Christmas. Well, if you've got a veto, you tend not to give it away. And even if, I don't know, maybe if a couple of charitable souls with a veto wanted to give it away, sure as God made little apples, the other three won't. So, you know, it's a problem. So then the debate has centred around how could the permanent membership be enlarged? Now, there's two issues about that. One is those who would see themselves as prime candidates for an enlargement, and there was a group of four, uh, Japan, uh, Germany, India and Brazil. They didn't want second-class citizenship with no veto. And in any case, for each of those, there was another country that said, no, you shouldn't have permanent membership because we're really quite important too. So, and then the proposals have been put up, uh, always did talk about two permanent seats for Africa. Um, one for Eastern Europe as well. But this has just uh, not gone anywhere, really. So it is, it is a problem. I mean, the IMF and the World Bank have probably gone better on, gone further on representational reform than the UN has been able to with the, with the Security Council. Uh, and in you know, the eyes of many, it, it just it lacks legitimacy the way, the way it is. So uh, it's, it's not going to be resolved quickly. I think that just as Kofi Annan, as uh, Secretary General, sort of facilitated and encouraged a debate uh, around reform of the Security Council going back to around 2005, that needs to happen again. I mean, the issues need to be more formally aired again. Uh, but I'm not, you know, pretending for a moment that they'll be quickly or easily solved. My country never supported the veto in 1945. I think we were far-sighted, but. You see, the way the world is, uh, maybe they'd never have got agreement on the Charter if the major powers hadn't had a veto. So that's 
swings and roundabouts, isn't it? The lady over here. Um, hello, um, I'm from uh, UNU Merritt as well as a master's student, and I was just quickly wondering, because uh, I heard you mentioned uh, more about the small island development developing states, and um, my question is just for interest base. Um, what do you think are the best linkages that these uh, SIDS have between the 2030 goals and maybe even the Samoa pathway? Um, and what do you think is the best way to uh, promote their plight within the international uh, community's discussion? Well, I see the Samoa pathway as pretty much a, a small island developing state interpretation of the sustainable development agenda. And, you know, I mean, talking of, of complications, every different part of the UN develops an agenda and it, it becomes absolutely overwhelming. So the small island developing states, they've got Paris, they've got the SDGs, they've got the Sendai framework on disaster risk reduction, they've got the, the Samoa pathway. Now, if we pretend that these are all different things with different action streams, we're never going to get anywhere. It all has to come back to the national plan and getting the international goals and standards and targets uh, reflected in the plan. And then, you know, next time there's a major small island developing state conference and they come around every decade or so, uh, you know, hope, hopefully you'll have you know, had action relevant to what was proposed and you can report against that and, 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 and so on. Now, as for voice for the small island developing states, of course, they're, you know, rather important group uh, within the UN and within the Commonwealth. I've just come from uh, the big week in London with all the events around the Heads of Government Summit. So of the 53 Commonwealth members, 25 are small island developing states. And the Commonwealth has become a very, very important voice for that community of, of states. Uh, it actually organises the representational office for them in Geneva so they can have their say on, um, on trade issues, uh, for example. Uh, I think, um, you know, th they, they have three overwhelming issues on the global agenda. One is climate change and the 1.5 degree target and support for adaptation to the appalling weather that's already there. And most of them want to do the right thing on being sustainable and getting out of fossil fuel based energy and using renewables and, and the technologies that go with that. Uh, secondly, trade is uh, uh, and trade barriers and access uh, for small island states. And then thirdly, there's the issue around concessional financing. Uh, because most small island developing states now are classified as middle income countries by the World Bank. And when you pass that threshold, you lose concessional lending. But the problem is they have, or m most of them have, inherent vulnerabilities. And climate change, natural disasters is, is one of them. And if you're Dominica and you've been wiped out twice within about four years by extreme storms, or you're Barbuda in Antigua and Barbuda and you lose 95% of your infrastructure last year, you can't keep borrowing commercially for that. You're not bankable. Uh, so uh, advocacy for concessional finance status uh, from the development banks for these kinds of events is, 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 is rather important. Economic viability, clearly a, a significant issue. The uh, economic base of the economies uh, can be quite limited. It might be, might be tourism, some do, do well. Uh, sadly, many one sees selling the fishing quota for a song and not getting ever to process uh, uh, any of it. So it, it can be quite tough. Um, but, uh, yeah, I see the Commonwealth role is important. And then in the UN system, there is a special representative who covers small island developing states, landlocked uh, developing countries, and the least developed countries. And that, that again, is a voice and a, and a platform. We probably have, unfortunately, um, a room for one more question. The gentleman in the back. Sorry for that. Hello, my name is Sinan. Um, thank you, first of all, for the talk. Um, I'm an intern currently at the Migration Group at, the, at UNU Merit. And I have a question regarding the future of international organizations like the UN. So for example, at uh, the Migration Group, um, there's like an like there, they we review programs of the IOM, for example, and they're government funded. So at the end, it, the money is coming from governments. And this is the same for the UN, this is the same for um, yeah, like basically all the international organizations. 
And now in Europe, we see a turn to authoritarianism or like more isolationism. In the US, we have the same. You said Trump will be away again in two and in, in, in after the two um, periods, but like. If that doesn't happen, if, uh, for example, the organizations like UNHCR, they already run into major funding problems, um, how do you see the? F do you see this will be? This might be a problem in the future. That um, like funding. Like, what is? Do you have any doubts about the future of the international organizations? Yeah, well, I mean, f fun funding is a problem. Uh, a number of the organizations. Uh, uh, used to have higher levels of baseline funding and governments are less inclined to give that these days and more likely to tag funding. Uh, but, you know, I mean, I, I personally think we found a way at UNDP to deal with that and try to, you know, continue to be strategic and follow a mandate while having to attract a lot of non-core funding. Uh, and the non-core funding was overwhelmingly uh, public funding. Um, I, I mean, there are, whole, there are quite a lot of risks around private funding of, of UN organisations. I instance in a discussion we had before this discussion that you know, I, I'm totally opposed to UN organisations and multilateral organisations going after funding from alcohol companies, and there's quite a high-profile case at the moment of a health-related organisation, not a UN one, uh, which has accepted an alcohol industry partnership in totally inappropriate way. There's a, you know, I mean, there there are good companies that you know any organisation would be proud to have as a partner, but you have to curtain off alcohol, tobacco, arms industry. In the case of WHO, you can't take money from pharmaceutical companies. Just can't. You, you know, you've got a normative role to play. So there are there are a lot of sensitivities. Uh, UNICEF has always had a very you know, strong aversion to Nestle uh, for a range of reasons, often around breastfeeding and you know the, the, the versus child uh, breastfeeding substitute and, and so on. Uh, so I, I would hope that the organisations would not feel so starved that they start going to inappropriate sources of, of private funding. I do think that uh, the uh, wealthier um, developing countries could be putting more into the baseline of the UN organisations, um, which, which they don't. And I think there's still you know, a bit of a philosophy <laughs> around uh, member states uh, which says, you know, developed countries give and we receive. But, you know, actually life's not like that anymore. The, Many of the major developing countries have major development budgets themselves, uh, but it's tending to be discharged bilaterally and not through the multilateral system. And frankly, if they care about the multilateral system, it needs some nurturing, because the, you know, the traditional partners just can't keep, you know, carrying the the degree of burden that they have for the system. So there need to be a lot of you know, frank discussions about that, really. Let me draw <coughs> on that uh, previous question for the last mm. word. We're, we're pretty lucky to have most mm. of the audience here made of mm. Massachusetts University and uh, the United mm. Nations University students. And mm. so what's your final message to, to young people who are full of ambitions, mm. who are more not not in shy, not shy away from embracing uh, multilateralism at a time when there is more retreat and mm. we have a lot of alternative facts. Mm. And on a more personal note, what does the future entail for you? Well, I think young people should not give up on the multilateral system, right? Yeah. You, we have to see our future as a shared one and we have to support the institutions uh, which work on behalf of all of us to try to build a better future. So whatever the organisation of your choice is, uh, you know, chances are it can do a lot of good if it it's continues to recruit the best and brightest. And regardless of what, you know, ever bad publicity the UN gets from time to time, believe me, the desire to get into it and be part of it is huge. I mean, <laughs> UNDP, you, you, we just get hundreds and hundreds and not thousands of applications for jobs. Uh, you know, people want to be part of it. So I think you know, that, that's important. I mean, people might not en end up in the UN, they might end up in their, their country's foreign ministry or development ministry or an international NGO, or in a private company, 
trying to do some good through sustainability and the way in which you invest and run the business. There are many, many ways of advancing the sort of ideas we've talked about today. But you know, my message is keep keep your idealism. You know, I remember on, with respect to the uh, the private sector being in a discussion somewhere sometime uh, with a chief executive of a major company, uh, which is very, very supportive of the World Food Programme. And someone said to him, why do you do this? And he said, I believe in it. You know, he said, I've always been in the private sector, but I wanted the company that I led to make a difference. And we have skills and expertise that we've been able to work with World Food Program on, and we're really proud of it. I had a meeting with the head of Deutsche Post uh, once mm. because UNDP uh, had a program with them on business continuity for airports in the event of disaster. And one thing about the post, it always gets through, right? That's the motto of every postal service, the post will get through. So they know about business continuity. I said, why do you do this? He said, it makes our employees proud that we are taking the knowledge and skills that we have and we're able to share and communicate that. So you can do good wherever you are, wherever you are. Uh, as for myself, um, I'm rather enjoying uh, being free of all institutions. <laughs> I spent uh, the first eight years of my employment at the University of Auckland, uh, the next 27 and a half in the New Zealand Parliament, and then eight at uh, UNDP, and now I do what I like. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I set my own priorities about what I want to advocate for and speak on and, and be part of. And believe me, there's plenty to do out there. Uh, plenty. Mm. On that kind of positive mm -hmm. note, I would like mm -hmm. to thank you very much for coming here today. I hope you learned a lot. I, I did. And I would like also to remind you that this is only one the first part of uh, two events. Uh, there will be a documentary screening at 5.30. It is free. And it would be here too um, about my journey with Ellen Clark. So I really invite you to be uh, coming back and coming back soon. Um, I would like, on behalf of you and your merits, thank uh, the um, UM amb uh, Ambassador Lecture Series. And I would also like to thank uh, Lumiere for hosting us in this beautiful venue. And thank you very much, Ms. Ellen Clark, for coming and visiting us here. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you.